Today's guest is Silvio Bodoni. He's the younger brother of the ADCC 88 kilogram champion, Giancarlo Bodoni. He trains at a new wave and we go over the style of training called functional patterns that he thinks is really good. And I also believe is probably one of the better training styles for BJJ. He kind of gives you a little insight on how to get started in it, what it's all about and what he loves about it. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Hey guys, my name is Silvio Bodoni. I'm a human biomechanics specialist here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I've been doing that for about four years. I've also been a jiu-jitsu practitioner since I was around nine years old. Um, so currently training under New Wave Jiu-Jitsu here in Austin, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on here. Yeah, thanks Silvio. Um, so what is functional patterns and like, why are you so interested in it? Yeah, so functional patterns is a training system that is essentially revolves around the four core um, functions that our human physiology was ha has adapted to. Uh, the first one being standing, your standing neutral posture, which is kind of just a, ba a baseline of where your relaxed standing posture should be. Um, and ultimately, if you can't stand in the right uh, joint stacking position, then it's probably going to translate into the rest of your movement. The second one's going to be walking. Um, so essentially that's kind of going into your gait mechanics. And as humans, we kind of uh, reciprocate contralaterally. So everybody knows that if you walk with your right arm swinging forward, the left leg is going to swing forward. So everybody kind of does that intuitively. And so there's a lot of like technical nuances that go into that. Uh, the third one is going to be sprinting, which is the one that we study the most, looking at the highest athletes, uh, the best athletes in the world, uh, such as like Usain Bolt, uh, Barry Sanders, and all these great runners. Um, and essentially, that's going to tie into um, your human physiology. And so if we've adapted to doing those functions primarily, then that's kind of what we're doing throughout most of our day. We're walking most of our day. And, and if, if, we're, if we're sitting, we're probably adapting to that seated position a little too easily. And it's kind of affecting um, our day-to-day -day, um, stressors, if that makes sense. Um, the fourth uh, one is going to be throwing. So throwing mechanics, um, kind of going just more into the shoulder girdle, but all still implementing the rest of the body in that. Um, things like punching, um, just throwing in general. And so those are kind of the four main uh, human functions that we've evolved to do. And so it kind of functional patterns kind of focuses on, uh, prioritizes, um, optimizing those mechanics first. And then everything that comes after that is just adapting to different contexts and being more adaptable in stressful situations. Okay. And, and like, so where does that differ from your kind of fundamental, like Olympic lifting or power lifting type strength training? Like, why is that more beneficial you think than those? Uh, I would say it's more beneficial just for the average person, um, unless you want to be, I think most people in the industry would agree with it this, with this at this point, is that if you are trying to be a better power lifter, then it would make sense to do those movements, uh, those compound movements, because you're getting better at one, those kind of, um, those, uh, dim those dimensional movements. However, none of those uh, movements take into account the physics, uh, the physics aspect in motion throughout our daily life. Um, so ultimately, if you can squat really well, it's probably not going to translate into your walking. If anything, it's probably going to make you worse at walking because you're not training those kinetic chains that connect your opposite glute to your opposite lat, etc. So those lifts, and there's a, a several uh, strongman athletes that agree with like deadlifts and things like that not being functional towards their practice just because they're more stressful on the on the back and the rest of the, the just your human body it's in general um because they don't make you dynamic they kind of make you strong in one dimensional and you see that in 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 uh in sports as well even things like jujitsu you'll get these bodybuilders that they're strong in those movements but it never translate on the it never translates on the mat. They're really strong in 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 kind of these straightforward movements when it comes to dynamic rotation, things like that, things that involve multiple planes and force vectors. They 
don't know how to translate that strength. So kind of what we do at FP is more so based around getting people to do uh, in the training room. Everything they do in the training room is designed to make them better at what they do outside of the training room. So okay. It's kind of focuses on optimizing their daily life and their just their daily movement patterns so that they can move pain free and just not worry about how they should be standing, how they should be resting, and then kind of basing everything they do or uh, supplementing with various um, outside substances to reduce inflammation. All those should be a result of optimizing your mechanics and training kind of intentionally and intelligently. Okay, and so for that, you know, you're saying you're training like intentionally and stuff. Would you say that functional patterns is more applicable towards athletes as well because you are working on those positions that you wouldn't normally be in? Uh, I would say so, absolutely. Um, the reason I'd say that is because it's, it was never designed for athletes. Uh, functional patterns is a training system that was designed primarily to make people that were not really inclined to be athletic to make them more athletic. Okay. And you see, like, just go to their results. Uh, their, I'll check out all their results on their on their Instagram, on their website. You'll see people that have been born with certain bone malformations that they could never get away with doing any types of exercise. And if they did, it kind of only compound their their current dysfunctions, if you want to call them. Um, and so it's kind of designed to make the unathletic individual more athletic. And I think if you could solve those problems, which are a lot more difficult to solve, and most like training practices kind of neglect the variables that you need to take into account to solve those problems, um, because it's not easy. I think if you can do that, it's gonna be a lot easier to work with athletes who are a little bit more connected to their bodies and just have those genetics in place um, just from their current standpoint. And why do you think that, like, I haven't heard much about it until I started talking to you about functional patterns, but why do you think it's so underutilized right now? Yeah, um, FP is still somewhat of a, a fringe um, kind of practice, I guess you can call it. Um, although in the past few years, uh, I have seen multiple athletes kind of getting into the practice a little bit more. I just trained yesterday with uh, Rainier. He's a a, 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 a a MMA fighter. He's kind of the one uh, the one uh, champion. Uh, I think he's the middleweight champion for the one FC. Um, and he's kind of also pretty knowledgeable in the in in, in the human body. He has his own practice in in Holland, um, and he was kind of understanding the value in it just because. Um, it's sorry repeat your question one more time <laughs> like uh why do you just think it hasn't really kind of caught on as oh much? yeah i think because it's not really catered towards it's hard to train athletes in in that practice just because a lot of them already can get away with the the, the compound lifts that they already do mm -hmm. so when it comes to people it's kind of catered more to just your average Joe and Jane and still the practice is still very innovative and it's not complete. I don't think it'll ever be complete. I think just biomechanics in general should be an ongoing study forever. And it's probably one of the most understudied uh, subjects. Um, and so the founder of FP Naudi, he's been pretty much doing the work from the ground up. So you have this kind of this one guy who's been kind of, putting all these pieces together, just observing, you know, natural human phenomenon and understanding how can we implement this into just society as a whole? How can we get normal people to replicate what these amazing athletes do? Um, and so I think for that reason, it's still relatively new. It's been about 10 years in the making. So I think in the next couple of years, people are going to start realizing that you need to evolve the training systems that have been currently put in place. Mm -hmm. People have been doing the same lifts for decades and only seeing kind of a decline and in, in, in people's um, in people's health. People are degenerating as generations go by and nobody's taking into account what's causing that. So I think you need to evolve the practice and take into account 
uh, one gravity that we're constantly fighting against and how can we decompress the structure to create more expansion in the body and so i think for that reason it's been underutilized however i think we're at a point right now where in the next couple of years we're going to see a huge growth in not only just fp but in this style of training in general okay and and with that um I know like you're pretty much at the Mecca for jujitsu and stuff. So you get to see some of the top athletes, but yeah. where do you think that this could go with jujitsu? Do you think it is one of the best training methods for jujitsu and, and combat sports in general? Cause we have also Kyle Dake is using it. So there are some combat sports people using it. Yeah, there have been some, some athletes using it. I think there's some, even a few people in the jujitsu community that are kind of getting into it. Um, I think it's definitely very valuable. Most sports, there's just like jujitsu is a perfect example. And it's very similar to, to biomechanics as a practice in that the context of where you apply technique and strength changes with every position that you're in. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we do at FP is that there's not just one position that you should be good at like posture in itself is like an ambiguous term because posture is all contextual standing neutral okay yeah there's a general premises of where you want your joints to stack but that changes depending on whether you're shooting a double leg um whether you're you know doing a fireman's carry whatever the movement is posture changes um and so the optimal posture changes excuse me and so all biomechanics is just the summation of of, and I'll take a quote from uh, Naudi, the founder himself. He says, all biomechanics is, is the summation of small movements in the body to facilitate larger movements. And so there's a kind of a mathematical equation that we're trying to uh, look for in, in relation to where the joints are moving in the space and what is most optimal in it, or beneficial for the structure in that position. Um, so just with that concept in mind, um, taking into account all the aspects of human movement, all the force vectors and all the stressors we're taking on, um, FP is kind of designed to make you more adaptable. And so if you can be more adaptable in various contexts, it's going to translate not only into your jujitsu, into your basketball, whatever practice you're in, but in your daily life. And if you're moving around with pain, and most athletes would kind of agree that when, when they're training, they don't necessarily feel the pain because mm -hmm. they're, every muscle in their body is firing. Um, but it's usually after the fact that they start feeling the pain when they're not doing the training. And if that's kind of consisting of 80% of your daily life is you're in pain, and then the other 20%, you're just kind of compounding the issues you already have, you need to have something to supplement that. And FP is kind of designed to make you better on a general basis and what you do on a daily basis. Do you think so, that, oh, sorry. You no, go ahead. Yeah. Do you think that people should be uh, kind of supplementing f for those top level grapplers FP as their strength training to use as a recovery method? Uh, that would be my recommendation. Um, just based on what we've observed, there's been far more benefits that people have had from doing FP, I've yet to see a person that does FP and they're worse off doing it. Just whether you're an athlete, whether you've been in a car accident, we have people that come in with that they've been in car accidents and their bodies are completely decompressed. The doctors have given them no hope. Ultimately, the people that walk into the door when I'm at FP Texas are all people that have tried everything and they end up always walking through those doors, whether they've done yoga, whether they've gone to chiropractors and nothing's worked and that's kind of their last stop shop. So okay. just going based off that, um, it just shows that there's a lack of empathy for what's going, what the issues that people are having. Um, so that's just from, from my observation and, and my colleagues and pretty much every other uh, practitioner we have right now, um, that that's kind of the, the audience that FP attracts. So usually if you get people that kind of have that foresight to walk in the door earlier, and there's already some people that are, are kind of ahead of the curve, 
um, they're going to reap the benefits. Okay. And like, it's kind of weird. Like everyone kind of looks at, you know, Gordon and those kind of guys and they, they're all jacked and stuff. And, yeah. But who knows what kind of pain they're in all the time. So why do you think that is the last stop that people take? And well, why don't people do it sooner instead? Um, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I don't know what goes on through everybody's heads and what, what that goes on through their life. Um, however, I would recommend that if you do value your health and your long-term health, whether you're an athlete who's kind of trying to take care of their body or just a person who wants to be able to play with their kids um, without having to go through pain and kind of train in a way that's regenerative, then just try FP. I would just suggest try it, see if it works and, and go from there. Um, if you can get into it before you have pain, great, good for you. Don't wait until you have pain. Don't wait until the problem has occurred for you to do something about it. Um, that's kind of what would be my suggestion. Um, I got into it when I was about 20, I'm 24 now. Um, I was 20 and I was training with, you know, very high level athletes at the time, uh, Lucas Lepre during his kind of his, his final uh, years competing. And I was training really hard. I was working with a moving company at the time. I was doing weightlifting. I'd just gotten my uh, personal trainer certification. So I was doing all the kind of the basic lifts. And even just at 20, I was like feeling like, man, like I'm not feeling like 100% right now. So I, I can only imagine what this is going to feel like in 10 years. But I think if everybody can have that foresight, and maybe most people don't take into account what things will look like in 10 years, people maybe don't think 10 years ahead. But I think if people can have that foresight, they can target problems way sooner than they actually occur. Okay. And and when you talk about how you should just get started and, you know, try it, what does yeah. that, that barrier to entry look like? Do I have to show up to an FP location or how can I get started? Yeah. So you don't have to show up to an FP location. What I recommend to most people is go to the Functional Patterns website, get the 10 week online course they always have discounts. I think without the discounts, it's 200 bucks. With a discount, it's typically like 150. And you have that information for pretty much forever. Um, everything that's on there is everything I kind of wish I knew before I even got into exercise in general. Um, so they have all kinds of like myofascial release techniques. You start learning about the myofascial uh, system. Uh, you start learning about the basic um, kind of core principles of FP and most people kind of start already getting benefits from that 10 week online course. If you're an extreme case, like somebody with like, like a crazy scoliotic curve um, or somebody that's been in a car accident where they're like super compressed on one side, whatever the case may be. Um, there's plenty of practitioners around the globe at this point. Um, if you don't have a practitioner near you, I think the website even has a place where you can search for a practitioner in your location, but there's also online practitioners. They have uh, in-person courses you could attend. Um, but for 150, the 10 week online course is pretty much a steal at this point. So I would suggest getting that before the price potentially goes up. Um, not saying it will, but it could. Um, I don't know really what they're doing on the back end, but that would be my first suggestion. And of course, if you're in Austin, Texas, we have the FP Texas facility here. And that's kind of one of the most reputable in the States at this point. They're the only other uh, affiliation that actually offers in-person courses and certifications. Um, and that's where I'm uh, training as well. And I'll be teaching there pretty soon. Um, so yeah, start with the 10 week online course and then work your way from there. And, um, it seems like this is more of like a whole rounded program where it's like I go into the gym, I do my lifts and then I go home and I have to figure out my supplementation. But yeah. FP seems to be like really focused on making you a whole athlete. Why, um, why do you think that like people aren't so much using it as that, like with the supplementation and stuff also, like what are you guys doing for supplementation? Um, it, I think FP kind of, simplifies it to where most of the you can get most of the benefits 
uh, you can get most things to benefit your health pretty much for free. Like all you need to do is get sunlight, stay well hydrated to make sure your tissues are well hydrated and so that they're malleable and adaptable. Um, be out, try to be outdoors um, and just train and just train in a way that's that's meant to optimize your mechanics. Um, it's really those little things. And of course you could do other supplementation. It depends on where you are in the world um, as well. So yes, yeah, sometimes you may have to supplement, but that shouldn't be the kind of the main, you shouldn't be having to compensate with those things. All the things that you do on a daily basis should be kind of the, the core elements that contribute to your health. And then everything else is extra. Um, so if you can do, if you can move well and you can stay hydrated and you can get sunlight and that you can do those three things, I mean, you're already way further ahead than most people. Of course, quality of food, um, a diet that, that works best for you. Um, and just having a kind of a, a whole, a, a whole food diet, try to stay away from, uh, processed grains and, and, and food colorings and, and, and just, uh, highly processed, uh, foods. It, at that point, you're already for, way further ahead than most people. So it doesn't, it really doesn't have to be that hard to look after yourself. It's just try different things to try those, those few things, see how it works for you. Try kind of elimination diet, um, and live uh, movement elimination diet. So maybe certain things that you're doing that, although they may be enjoyable, but they're kind of contributing to harming your body try and laying off it for a bit and see how you feel. Um, and just kind of, it's a, it's kind of an experiment, uh, experimentation process. Um, so I think if people kind of have the patience to gauge and kind of see intuitively what is best for them, uh, they're going to be again, way further ahead than, than most. Okay. And, and when it comes to supplementation, uh, this might be a little bit of a hot topic for you, but, uh, uh um, you know, we kind of are seeing the rise of steroids. Well, not the yeah. rise, but the like rise of steroids being out in our like jujitsu industry. Would you say someone should try FP as a as a like method for you, having good recovery before they go to steroids? Yeah, I would never really recommend going straight to like exogenous substances as kind of your first choice when it comes to uh, bettering your health. Um, definitely try a, a, a training program that's going to contribute to your, to your, your joint health, uh, and your muscles adaptability to kind of hold you in space. Um, try that first. Um, and you probably won't have to resort to steroids or HGH or, or anything like that. All right. <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, and then for like BJJ, where are you seeing like the most improvement in your jujitsu with this new training style? Um, I've kind of just been going, uh, I've, I've been doing FP. I've, I've, when I first started FP, I had to take a, a couple of years off of jujitsu um, just because I had a hard time. I already have like was working on certain issues and I knew that if I was going to put my body into stressful situations where I have somebody trying to manipulate my mechanics essentially to kind of put me at a disadvantage. It's probably not going to be the best for my, for my joints. So I had to work on that first. And then once I kind of got that done, I started kind of re implementing jujitsu, uh, seeing where it was at. I did find that no gi was a lot better on my, on just on the body in general, maybe the gi, there was too much friction. It was too tension based. Uh, so nogi feels a lot better the, the kind of the wrestling i can kind of work on the wrestling mechanics which seem to be pr pretty functional um however i i don't know every, everybody's kind of told me i don't really do any weightlifting. all i do is is kind of full body corrective uh stuff and then sometimes i, I amp it up with with the weights or just uh the, the volume a little bit um but that's pretty much all i do is fp and everybody's told me i'm like 170 and everybody tells me I'm pretty like weirdly well, John himself actually told me, he's like, Oh, you're, you're weirdly, you have this weird combination of like strength and flexibility. It's like really <laughs> strange. And I'm like, well, it's FP, man. It's just working on my biomechanics. 
So, I mean, I think just, I, I felt pretty good after training as well. Like, I don't feel uh, like I want to go lay down. Like, I feel pretty good after training. So, that's kind of a, a good sign. Um, so, yeah, that's just kind of what I've observed. Huh. And, and you said that you felt kind of shitty in the gi. Why you think it's just because of those static holds, or do you think there's something different about the gi that and no gi with the friction? Um, perhaps that's just kind of been my my observation is just that no gi I can kind of I feel a little bit more free with the gi. Yeah, I did feel like there was so much tension that like I don't know it just wouldn't feel like my body wouldn't feel as great after it. Um, okay. But maybe that's because I haven't done gi in a while, and then I tried jumping back into it, and so it just felt a little bit different. Um, but yeah, I've just been sticking with with no gi, especially training here. Yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. imagine. <laughs> uh, and then, so if someone wanted to start jujitsu, do you think that they should also start uh, FP at the same time? Because I know a lot of people will start jujitsu, and then they're like looking on BJJ fanatics, and it's like yeah. Gordon, how to do a hundred curls, <laughs> you yeah. know, like. It, <laughs> So do you think that FP should be your main training regiment if you're going to start jujitsu? Yeah, I'd say if you're going to start jujitsu um, and you're training already, I would say try FP first, kind of prime your body first, just so you mm -hmm. understand those, what kind of what your dysfunctions are, um, how your body's compensating, kind of hold, hold you in space figure that out first, figure out the problems you need to work on, on a personal physiological level, then, then try doing jujitsu. Um, but yeah, definitely work on that first. And if you do do jujitsu, definitely stick with FP. So that way you can, at least if you're not training on the mats or, or doing anything else, you can work on just solving on solving your problems. And I think that's, that's kind of also kind of helped me build confidence just in my daily life is knowing that I'm actively trying to solve my problems. Then it makes every, everything else a little bit, a little bit easier. Okay. And you're kind of like in this um, science lab almost with the new wave school. How yeah. are you like trying to bring that into the school and bring it to John and Gordon when when they're having this like set mindset of they know what workouts to do, how, how do you implement that and teach them? I mean, I haven't really like pushed it. Uh, I try not to push it because um, I don't want to like impose my, I used to do it a lot when I first got into it. I'm like, dude, you got to do this. You got to do this. But now it's like whoever sees the value in it, that's kind of who, I, who I'm going to uh, give my attention to. Of course, I'll, I'll recommend it to people. Um, but I'm not going to like force it down people's throats. You know, I think that's going to come with time. People are going to eventually see the value in it. Um, uh, I have a, a few people that have, um, have been interested in it, like uh, Chloe, who also trains at, at, at New Wave. Um, there's, uh, I told you that guy, Rainier from, from Holland, he's, he's been here. Um, and so little by little, if people s seek interest and value, my whole thing is, I want to prove I can get the results first, and then if people see that, then that's 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 who I'm gonna kind of give my attention to. If that makes sense. Your brother just uh, left you hanging, I guess. <laughs> oh, my brother, he's definitely he's definitely into it. He was uh, um, when he was training in Boston uh, when he was teaching at Bernardo's over there. Mm -hmm. He had, uh, had a friend of mine named Kino who lived in Boston as well. And he's done a good bit of work and he was also certified through FP. Uh, we got certified together actually. And, um, he was doing some work. So Jack, Jack has really good, like fundamentals. And since I moved here, well, be even before I moved here, we worked like on and off whenever we see each other. But since I moved here, yeah, we're going to start doing, doing more work together. He understands the value in it. Um, uh, kind of all that rotational and how it translates to jujitsu as well. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be, uh, kind of keeping, keeping that, that train going and seeing if that'll help them with that works see a little bit, a little bit easier. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and, and with this training, does it, do you notice that because you're not in pain and you're not feeling like Jesus Christ, everything hurts, um, you kind of can focus more in on your drilling and your technique. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've, uh, for the past, like 
year and a half, um, I had a, a, a tear in my labrum, my hip labrum. Um, this was like started uh, when I got injured in jujitsu and kind of eventually had to take that time off. Um, so I kind of injured my knee. And then I think what happened was like, I was still working with a moving company at the time. And so I had to take time off work. And then when I would go back, I could, I could walk and it was fine. But after a certain amount of time, it would like, you know, obviously you're carrying heavy boxes, gun safes, pianos, things like furniture, all that kind of stuff. And I would notice after a while, my knee would start getting sore and I would start kind of having this limp where I would like, it kind of impacted the way I, uh, absorbed pressure in my hip and I think that contributes to some kind of cartilage damage in my hip and that's the only thing I could re really uh, think of and so that kind of made me really um, cautious about how I would approach my training so I would like be scared to like even do it shoot any, any takedowns or anything like that um, so that's kind of been my main focus and actually, since I, I moved here to Austin, I've been working with some of the practitioners at FP Texas, and um, they kind of helped me gain a lot more stability in that area. So now I can drill, and the first time, kind of after my first few sessions, I was able to just train and not really have to think about my, my hip, like the position I'm in and all that stuff. And then after training, I would like walk, and I'm like, I'm not really hyper-focused on my hip anymore. I don't have to really think about this. And I kind of noticed that I was, as I was walking to my car. And so that kind of gave me this boost of confidence where I'm like, yeah, this, this feels great. Like now I can actually dial in on, on the technique and, uh, and train without worrying about, uh, you know, damaging my body in the process. Yeah. That, that's kind of crazy that that just yeah. made you like healed almost. Um, yeah. What, what is your kind of jujitsu path looking like this year? Like what, what are your goals for that? And I mean, we know you're, you're the little brother, Giancarlo. So like, are you looking to live up to that? Are you looking to be that FP kind of like you're the guy that everyone goes to in jujitsu or that functional training? What, what do you want to do? Yeah. So, I mean, as far as uh, FP, that's what I feel like my main purpose is is or the, the purpose i've kind of granted or given myself is to th the main reason i moved here as a matter of fact i was working at a gym in, in tennessee uh this startup gym over there it was supposed to be like a jiu-jitsu slash fitness where i was like okay this would be a good idea that i can kind of like put my my everything i've been studying and investing my time and money into I can kind of start implementing this into this into this gym and that kind of you know that didn't work out so i was like yeah what you know what am i going to do so i was looking at fp texas and pretty much moved you know my whole life kind of resorted everything down to a few boxes and, and moved to, to austin well actually the first time i was in austin i uh was visiting john carlo for his birthday like uh, Rebecca, uh, his wife was like, Oh, you want to visit surprise junket for his birthday? And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. So I was here and then found out, Oh, FP Austin's here. So I've never been to like an FP facility. So I was like, I gotta go check that out. Um, so I went and checked it out and it's like, as soon as I walked in, I was like, this is, this is where I gotta be. Um, so kind of, uh, applied did the whole interview process and then, in between that, uh, I was also training at, at, at the Roca when I was here. And so everybody was like super welcoming there. So I was like, okay, you know, I got Jiu Jitsu, I have FP. This is like a perfect like link to, to having these two things together. Um, and so if I can provide obviously value to, to the athletes there and, and just that community, fantastic. Um, but ultimately my, my main thing is I want to, help the people that see the value in, in the training again i'm not going to force any information down people's throats you know i moved here uh to kind of refine that craft um and as far as jujitsu i would still like to compete i do plan on competing um uh, pretty soon i'll be uh trying to do the adcc trials in uh in september i believe it's in september i think so 
Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. Cause I'm like, might as well. <laughs> That's that, true. that helps kind of push the name of FP as well. I can see if that kind of helps contribute to, to my jujitsu, then that'd be great as well. Um, but yeah, my whole thing is I want to develop that skill so I can kind of be of value, uh, to, you know, to a community of people that, that need the help essentially. Yeah. And, and you're in kind of like the, the perfect community to test that on and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think if I can, uh, implement that into athletes as well as just kind of average people that, you know, weren't as fortunate with either their genetics or just, you know, have had certain accidents in their life. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of what, what, where I get my, my gratification from is, is, is helping those people. Um, and then athletes as well, if I can, if I can do that and help them kind of push their career a little, a little bit further, kind of just like Kyle Dake was before he got into FP, he was contemplating his retirement basically. And then he went from that to doing FP to winning another national championship. So against Jordan Burroughs. So that's kind of, you know, that says a lot in itself. Yeah, that does. And, and when you like, you have your Roka training center. So when we think about FP and, and it's, uh, it's training ideologies, what are we like looking for in terms of equipment? So for like me, I, I go in the gym and I just look for the squat rack and the deadlift platform. Yeah. It, what should I be looking for if I want to start FP? Yeah. If you want to start FP, um, again, assuming you want to start with the 10 week online course, that's like, takes pretty minimal equipment. I think all you need is like couple resistance bands if you don't have access to a cable machine mm -hmm. couple resistance bands um maybe a medicine ball some massage balls like a lacrosse ball um and i think that's pretty a couple like light dumbbells or, or a kettlebell and i think that's pretty much all you need like you really don't shouldn't need that much stuff to become, uh, to, to make yourself stronger, or just move better. Um, you know, like lions, cheetahs, they don't use any equipment, but they get, they, they're freaking freakishly strong. That's uh, true. <laughs> so I think, yeah, if you can just focus on like what those core main functions you're trying to improve at, which is going to be standing, walking, running and throwing, um, that's going to translate in, in pretty much every context. And then over time, as time goes on, you can start at, adding weight to that and then that's kind of where you you'll know, gain you know muscular benefits and start kind of gaining in size if that's what, what you wanted to do and and i was watching a little bit and like doing some fp research i see they use a lot of the like uh the cones or whatever they're called the hands or mallets and um oh yeah the, the clubs yeah. yeah yeah the clubs yeah i've seen that and then i saw some guy like doing this like spear throwing thing yeah uh, so is that yeah. kind of the next progression as you start to get into like the, the Joe Rogan workout pretty much? <laughs> yeah. So those, uh, those types of workouts, um, those are going to be like the more dynamic types of workouts. There's a lot of things going into that. It's not just kind of mindlessly like swinging your joints around. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like internal and intrinsic um, muscle groups that you're getting involved when you're doing that. So from outside, it looks like they're just swinging stuff, but there's a lot of like again, technical nuances that go into that. Um, you know, I always make the example of like everybody runs, like everybody can, or most people have the capacity to, to run or jog, but there are people that do it better than others. Like what do you classify as doing it better? Well, that's kind of where the study of biomechanics comes into play. Like what makes you St. Bolt a better runner than, you know, me, for example. Like there's certain things that his body's capable of doing and kind of uh, just the ratios in which certain joints are moving in his body in relation to others. And that that's kind of what, what we're focusing on. Um, so yeah, the same thing applies to those dynamic uh, swinging movements, um, those kind of parabolic motions that we do. Um, but that also comes, you know, after once you've developed those fundamentals first. Okay. And so, so what does an average like workout, uh, for you look like, like your day of working out? So that would include jujitsu, eating, um, supplementation, and yeah. then your, your FP kind of workout. Yeah. So like when an average day for me looks like I either do jujitsu first and then an FP workout. Um, so let's say, I, you know, I'll wake up. So sometimes I'll eat breakfast. Sometimes I don't depending 
you know, how I feel that day. Um, I definitely hydrate as much as I can. Um, I go to FP. I spend about, you know, eight hours there, uh, just do either doing classes and then soon I'll be uh, instructing people and, and taking cl teaching classes as well. Um, so, uh, kind of a the basis of what an a FP exercise looks like is you'll do some kind of chamber workouts, which is another word for a corrective exercise, essentially. So it's kind of really just focusing on um, addressing my mechanics and different uh, in different movements, making sure that all the muscles are firing appropriately, um, and then maybe some intense uh, kind of coupling that with a a little bit more of an intense workout, but it varies depending on, you know, what I feel like I need to work on that day, for example. Um, then after that, you know, I eat, have some like animal protein and a bunch of fruits, um, and maybe some like simple carbs just because I'm exercising a lot. Um, then I'll do some, some training. So it'd be like an hour and a half, two hours of, uh, of drilling at Roca and then uh, training, uh, with that. And then after that, it's either I just come home, rest, eat, I do some computer work, um, and you know maybe some myofascial release techniques like self massage if I'm feeling like restricted somewhere, um, and that's yeah that's, that's that's pretty much it. Maybe like a recovery day, maybe I'll go to the park, uh, like lay in the sun. Um, yeah, I try to get as much nutrition as I can from like natural sources. Um, and then if I am working out a lot and I feel like I need to hydrate more, I'll like take some electrolytes, um, salts so that I'm kind of retaining fluids, uh, making sure kind of all of that's, uh, dialed in. I don't really track my macros as much. Mm -hmm. I try to eat like maybe around 3000 to 3,500 calories a day. Um, just to kind of maintain my weight, my current weight. Um, and that's, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much it. And, you, and I've heard you kind of say and, and like hit on fluid retention a lot and hydration. Yeah. What does that look like? Like for me, I wake up and I do like a tablespoon of salt and then I drink my water and then I have my gallon throughout the day. For you, like what, what do you think best practices is? Uh, for fluid retention? Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I like, I don't really stuff on it with like creatine or anything like that. I used to, but I eat plenty of like, uh, uh, like red meat. For, mm -hmm. for example, so there's plenty of creatine in there, um, but usually I have like some kind of uh, electrolyte um, supplement or just salt, um, and then like some kind of electrolyte drinks. Um, Rebecca, she makes these like juices, like these electrolyte juices with like pineapple and, and different things. Um, so that's pretty much what what I do. Is sometimes I'll use that supplement or just salt, and I'll have that throughout the day um, or in the morning. And then that, that's pretty much it. Yeah, fluid retention is pretty important. But kind of outside of that, one thing that people will talk about is where in your tissues you're actually retaining your fluid. Mm -hmm. So once you start learning about the myofascial techniques and, and kind of how to um, address certain restrictions in your musculature, there's certain areas in the muscle. I'm sure if you've done like a, uh, like a massage, you felt like knots. Some people would like classify them as knots or whatever. Mm -hmm. or certain restrictions in the musculature all that pretty much is is like like dehydrated tissue and so when you start learning about uh, those kind of myofascial techniques to start breaking down those dehydrated tissues um that's going to essentially allow for fluid to re-enter those areas so that way you have a nice kind of plump um muscle that's that's has the full capacity to contract and then lengthen um, typically when you have a restriction or like uh, you know calcium deposits or these kind of dehydrated tissues that's going to kind of be an isolated portion of the muscle to where if you do try to lengthen that muscle that dehydrated portion isn't going to get the full the, the full capacity to lengthen so being able to break that restriction down is also going to create a better capacity for that entire kinetic chain to connect and lengthen and contract, which is ultimately going to increase that muscle's potential uh, just on a general basis. So one is addressing those dehydrated portions in your tissues and then hydrating after the fact so that you can kind of 
put water back into those tissues uh, when necessary. So, you, and you're saying that, and as you're talking about the lengthening of the muscle yep. and everything, um, we kind of, as jujitsu guys, it's like, oh fuck, my neck hurts right after practice. Let me just yeah. stretch it out. Is so that's actually the like wrong thing to do. You should start to kind of address it at the like myofascial level, and then hydrate it, and then stretch it out. Yeah, um, as far as like like stretching, like myofascial release is kind of a form of stretching. It's pretty much like the only form of stretching I use. That's okay. that is I passively uh, that I passively do. Um, I never like to passively just stretch a muscle. And this is kind of one thing that I've learned from FP is, and we, we've kind of known this for a long time as well, um, is that the the best way to stretch a muscle is to kind of correlate that stretch through a some kind of contraction in the body. Like there's a difference between like stretching your tricep passively like this and then stretching your uh, your tricep with a flexion of the bicep so I, I try to incorporate stretching like sometimes i'll be doing corrective exercises and i get like incredible stretches through areas that i've never felt before like whether it's a restricted area in my hip or, or my lumbar or my lumbar spine or whatever but it's not a passive stretch it almost mm -hmm. feels like that muscle's actively lengthening but it's via a contraction on the reciprocal uh, through the reciprocal uh muscle okay. um so that's how i orient my, my training i try not to passively stretch because ultimately when you're stretching a muscle you're kind of weakening that muscle and if you don't teach that muscle to lengthen via some kind of contraction you're only kind of you're only just weakening that muscle just arbitrarily stretching is never a really smart thing to do in any context um so yeah i try to stretch via doing my, my exercises or through myofascial release techniques primarily okay and i know um i've, I've watched like a little knees over toes guy i think he talks mm -hmm. kind of a lot about like actively stretching but yeah. where is that like how different is knees over toes versus fp like obviously it's yeah. more whole yeah i think it's just the the context I think it's just con context matters mm -hmm. in, in anything you're doing. Um, so it's like actively stretching, but like in what context and what's kind of, how does that translate? You know, like what is the reason you're stretching? I don't know specifically, I don't know too much about the knees over toes practice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if, if he, if he advocates for actively stretching, then I would just be interested in knowing exactly what context, yeah. Okay, and when we talk about the context and stuff and that kind of goes back into um, like the clubs and stuff and, and that yeah. and really when you start to build FP around yourself as an athlete, are you building like, if I want to do like rubber guard, I'm trying to get moves where I'm like actively doing that kind of thing. Is yeah. that how I would build an FP program to an athlete? Yeah, absolutely. I think it depends on the person as well. Like the one thing I've learned about FP is it's not like a, there's no like one size fits all. There's no like one exercise you can give somebody. And this is where mm -hmm. I think most practices, like they do really well and they get like, they're, they're brand new and they start uh, blowing up in the first couple of years, but then it ends up tapering off yeah. because I think most people, they tr if everybody tries the same pro program or the same exercises some people are going to gain benefits but not everybody it's all kind of contextual so fp kind of caters specifically and this is why it's hard to like just come up with a program for just on a general basis for people to do is because every body is different or everybody's different so it's 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 all contextual like um if you're going to have people you know running backwards on, on a treadmill but then you have people that are already have a propensity to be in trunk flexion. Then why would you have them? Then why would you have them in trunk flexion? Just kind of reinforcing their current state. It just kind of d doesn't make sense in that aspect. Um, not to say that all the exercises are wrong. I think it just doesn't take into account that it's not going to work for everybody. Does FP use some of the like classic exercises like squats, deadlifts, those kind of things? Uh, it does certainly use it. I think it just the most important thing to kind of consider is that it doesn't prioritize them. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with the movement of like 
squatting or deep squatting or deadlifting um, or doing a bicep curl, for example. It's just the fact that that has been prioritized as like the standard for human strength and, and movement. But okay. not that's not what humans do on a daily basis. So I think the, the, the only problem with those movements is that we have now adapted to them too easily. And it's kind of made us, uh, it's made it harder for us to do anything that involves kind of dynamic and contralateral movements. Um, so there's nothing wrong with them. It's only that there's now something wrong with it because people do it too much. And it's, it's not, it's, it's too simple of an exercise. Like, like the, the whole goal is you want to eventually start to make things a little bit more complex and, and change the context. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a compounding, um, uh, effect to those movements that is going to eventually makes them to where you get strong in the short term, but then eventually it starts to make you, it starts to be degenerative. Dang. So the FP kind of brings you back to like a baseline health almost. Yeah. And then it helps you like build. There's no, there's no like one thing, there's no one exercise you should be like prioritizing. The whole point is to change the context and make your body more adaptable essentially. Okay. And, and when it comes to like FP and what you're doing and kind of taking the career path towards that, uh, how, how did you do that? You got your certification, you were a PT, like probably did like NASM or ACE or something. And then you, you went into FP, like, what does that look like? Yeah. So I started, uh, if you want to do like, you're saying if, if you want to get like certified, if like how yeah. I got, went through that process, mm -hmm. um, I, the, the, I think the prerequisite for anything is the 10 week online course. Okay. So after that, if you want to continue with the online education side, they have like, uh, they have the next thing would be the functional training system, which then goes from the 10 week online course where you have like the fundamentals of FP and then the functional training system goes into a little bit more dynamic movements where you can start applying them in, in those different contexts and getting into some of those more parabolic and dynamic motions like you were mentioning mm -hmm. uh, for like strength training, et cetera. Um, however, if you want to get certified, the first in-person course that they have available is the human foundations course. And those, th that's pretty much for, for anybody, not even if you don't want to be a professional, I know a lot of people that have gone to those courses that just do it for their own personal, um, knowledge and, and development. Um, that's the first one. You start getting a little bit more in depth with those fundamentals and start getting a little bit deeper with, uh, with, uh, kind of the, the techniques and kind of expanding on what we, we've already learned. Then after that, you have the human biomechanic specialist courses, which kind of gets a little bit more technical. Um, you start getting into uh, the basis, like a lot of ro rotational movements, like uh, what context uh, the humerus needs to rotate. And, you know, it's all kind of builds onto the gait cycle and, and how to optimize that primarily. And then everything else is extra. But all the movements you do is, is meant to make you a better mover from a, a human standpoint. And then that translates pretty much into every sport. I think the, what people need to remember is that every sport humans do is only possible because our physiology is kind of elicited that, uh, has, has made that possible. Like if humans were like chimps, basketball would be like a different sport. You know, like it, the, the demands would be different. So I think people need to take into account human physiology first and what the priorities of the human body are first. Then you can expand off of that. Okay. And then uh, do you have like some resources that you use? I know that like the in industry is kind of hard to jump in because you're reading a lot of medical journals and yeah. stuff. But what are like some easy to digest resources that you've used? Uh, like articles, books, things like that. Yeah, even YouTube channels or like yeah, anything. YouTube channels. Uh, I think F Functional Patterns has a YouTube channel. But if you want to get more in depth, their website has an articles um, section where they have like it's like a crazy amount of information like for you to choose from. Um, they have any anything about uh, like diet. They have uh, talking about. Um, anxiety and uh, nonverbal communication 
Um, they have things talking about uh, the deadlift, for example. They have an article about the deadlift, and it gets a little bit more in-depth into why um, the deadlift can be uh, traumatic for most people um, and various resources on there. Um, on the website, you can also find a book written by the founder that's called The Power of Posture. And that's kind of one of the, the most pivotal moments in, in the, the company that's kind of uh, opened the eyes to a lot of people is, is that book itself. Um, another one that I would recommend people look into is Anatomy Trains written by Tom Myers. That goes into a lot of the myofascial slings and kinetic chains that the, the human body just kind of uh, utilizes th throughout your uh, daily life. Um, a lot of FP methodology is based around those uh, those functions. Um, so yeah, I would start with those primarily. Okay. And, and who would you say were, were the three most like influential people in the FP space right now? Um, in the FP space, um, I want to say the, well, definitely, um, the founder Naudi, he's, he can be pretty, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but some of the stuff he says is, is very uh, uh, put very bluntly, even though it's very rational. Um, he comes he comes from a good place when he's when he's divulging the information, but of course it kind of goes against what a lot of the industries are like currently uh, saying. Mm -hmm. um, so he's been definitely a very pivotal figure in the space, uh, not just to me, but just in in the space in general. Um, another person that I listen to, he's not anything relating to FP, um, but uh, some of his, his lectures would be Jacques Fresco. He's a very a kind of a very smart individual. Um, and so I listen to a lot of his lecture and just kind of his way of thinking and, and his very mechanistic mindset, which I found to be very valuable in, in, my, in, my, uh, in my craft, just because kind of having the capacity to, to be rational and solve the problems and how to how to tackle certain problems um is kind of a, a skill that I, I needed to develop um so i would say those those primarily are uh, are, are big and of course tom myers the the author of anatomy trains uh he has a lot of valuable information uh in relation to the human physiology and and, and human movement and, and body work as well um and fascia he talks about the connective tissue fascia um and all that's uh pretty interesting uh, okay and then going back to the founder and how you're saying it's kind of controversial what would you yeah. say is like the number one thing people say about fp that you just it's not true um well i don't want to say he is controversial he may seem controversial to a lot of people um but as far as the one thing people will say about fp that um I don't know. People say a lot of things. It's definitely not a cult. Like some people will describe it, describe it to be. I think it's just a lot of people that are kind of focused on um, the the more long term uh, idea of human health, and that's just kind of the, the main focus. There is just taking into account certain principles that caters to the larger the the, the more the more so the masses um and taking certain uh just certain lifestyle uh changes that you can alter to minimize your levels of pain anxiety stress and make you a little bit more adaptable to to the environment around you ultimately um our tendencies are going to be uh, a, a result of how we adapt to our environment and I think if you're not adaptable enough, it's going to be a little bit harder for you to just get by in, in life. So I think just being a little bit more uh, thoughtful about how you kind of operate in your daily life is going to potentially going to give you a little bit more of a of a, a, a long term solution. If you can follow this a, a certain blueprint just one basic blueprint um, it's, it's going to in, in FP kind of methodology, it's going to give you a little bit more of a an easier time on how you can target and 
solve your own issues and that's ultimately going to minimize your, your stress levels. And that's kind okay. of the, the whole point of it is just minimizing stress and being more adaptable because stress is not a bad thing. It's just how you adapt to stress. Okay. And you're talking about like adapting and following these blueprints and stuff. Yeah. Um, kind of bringing it back to jujitsu. What, what was the difference that made you choose this path and your brother went the way he did? Cause I'm guessing you guys grew up and like did everything to yeah, yeah together. I, absolutely. Yeah. We did. We started jujitsu together. Um, he became a little bit more, um, he became a little bit more serious about taking jujitsu to kind of a competitive level. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of, I really liked, like we, we always did a lot of sports. Jujitsu is the one we've done for the longest, but I've always just been fascinated with just human movement in general. Um, so I just liked the, the dynamic and, and aspect of jujitsu. Of course, the mental aspect as well is kind of, it's that kind of that, that, under pressure problem solving skill you need to develop which is very similar to biomechanics as i mentioned um and so i guess i kind of follow more the path of like how can i get everybody else to kind of do the same like i was we were always pretty athletic um i was you know pretty pretty athletic as, as a kid and so i never experience what it's like to not be able to do sports mm -hmm. um so i think i wanted to focus on how i can get everybody else to kind of have that same freedom in their movement and that's kind of where that where that path oh did we lose you sylvia Oh, you're there. We got you. Hello? Uh, hey, no, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know what happened. It's okay. Um, yeah, so you were just saying that, that kind of that path that led you to be more interested in the biomechanics kind of side of it. Yeah. So would you say you you almost are more taking the like John route of jujitsu where you're focusing on like teaching uh, and, I, I, yeah, and instructing? That's a kind of a, I'll take that compliment, but, um, yeah, uh, I guess more so that, that route and yeah, trying to, I'm, I don't really want to see it as a, I'm like mentoring people. I guess my, my job is primarily just to kind of show people what the path they need to take is. And cause I can't make people improve their biomechanics. Like ultimately it's going to come down to my ability to relate to them as best as I can so that they know how to solve their problems. And that's kind of what, what my, what my, my job is. Okay. And, and if you were in my shoes, like what would you have asked that you want people to know about FP that you think I didn't ask? Um, I think you, you asked a lot of really good questions. Um, I think that, that that's, that's pretty, that was pretty much nothing that comes to mind at the moment. Um, Feel like I covered it good. Yeah, well, that's, that's, yeah, that's yeah, what matters. Try kind of covering all the <laughs> topics. Yeah, sweet. And then uh, I try to ask my guests this question, but like, what what does BJJ mean to you? I mean, your life's kind of centered around it in a weird way, mm -hmm. but so like, what does it mean to you really? Uh, Jujitsu. Um, I would say it's, it, it means it's, it's kind of a, sets a, a precedent of what I want my body to be capable of doing. Um, so I use jujitsu as a, a, an example of how I can not only, not only test obviously my, my mentality and, and my psychology and my ability to solve problems under pressure. Um, but that's kind of what I do in my practice as well. So it's good to kind of have two hobbies that I get to challenge myself mentally. Uh, and physically. So I use it, I think I, I like to see it as a, a basis of if I'm capable of, of doing jujitsu really well, I'd say, I'd say that that makes me a pretty, uh, I'd say it makes me successful in, in, in my practice. So I use biomechanics as a means of healing my body and using that to test, okay, is it really translating well in this sport? Um, 
And then of course, outside of that, I'm doing a lot of uh, testing my gait cycle and sprinting and see how well I, I can adapt to that. And what I've noticed is the better I get at running, the better I get at, at not only jujitsu, but just, just in general, like I feel pretty good. It's not, it's not normal to experience pain on a daily basis. Um, so I, I that's something new. Yeah. I think that's, that's <laughs> new for a lot of people. It's like this kind of no pain, no gain mentality. But like what type of pain are we really talking about? Like, should our joints really be grinding against each other? And we have to push through that for 40 years until our joints can't take anymore. And we have to like have a surgery or otherwise we can't walk. Like, it's just not normal. Um, and I kind of refuse to believe it is normal. Are you looking to get some new gear for your rolling and lifestyle needs? Submission Fighting Co. has you covered both out and inside the gym. The quality is amazing and I love the little detail like these patches on the rash guard and don't forget about the elastic on both the shorts and shirts. They keep it modern with designs made by Ed May right out of my old home, the Bay Area. Our community is small so let's always try and support each other. Use code GWG to get 10% off your next order at submissionfightingco.com. Well, that's good to good to know, and uh, yeah. and then just tell everybody kind of where they could find you, Silvio, and uh, what, what's up for you for the next uh, year, I guess, and we'll we'll finish it out there. Yeah, so I, I pretty much the only social media I have at the moment is is Instagram, so I'm, you can find me there at Silvio Bodoni, as uh, S I L V I O B O D O N I on Instagram. Um, you can also find me at FP Texas. That's in here in Austin, Texas. Um, so if you want to come in and check out the facility, I highly recommend you guys do that. Just check it out and maybe get an assessment done and see what value you can gain from it. Um, and yeah, that's kind of a, pretty much the only reason I, I moved to Texas was for, for that. Um, and just to kind of keep refining my craft. And, uh, so far I've been really happy with the environment. And so it's only been about a month that I've been here. Um, so, so far I've you know, love and life, uh, training at, training at Roca as well. Uh, and being, a, being surrounded by really good people at FP Texas. Um, so let's see, I'm really excited for the next, uh, next few years here. I don't really see myself, uh, having to, to go anywhere else at the moment. Um, so yeah, I think we'll see, I'll be, uh, trying to compete as well. And, uh, whilst doing that, I'll be focusing on kind of refining my craft, working on, on my own personal issues and, helping people um, solve their own in process. Sweet, Silvio. Well, that was, uh, that was great, and I think people will get a lot out of it. Absolutely, man. I appreciate, appreciate uh, having the opportunity.